Hey there, everyone. My name is Grant, and you are listening to the History of the Modern Middle East podcast, Episode 3, Coups and Counter Coups. In the previous episode, we covered the last decade before the Young Turks Revolution of 1908, with all the rivalries between the different factions, the different means they wish to use, and their preparations for major political change. In this episode, we will finally cover the revolution itself and the attempt to undo it. Before the actual revolution began, there were serious efforts by the Committee of Progress and Union, or CPU, to convert as much of the Ottoman military to its side through propaganda, especially the units serving in western Anatolia. In 1907, the CPU gained access to the army through a secret organization of pro-reform officers called the Ottoman Freedom Society, or OFS. The CPU absorbed the OFS and used its connections to recruit as much of the army as possible. The Ottoman army had been organized into different army corps on instructions from the Germans. The army corps that was the most influenced by the CPU after the absorption of the OFS was the 3rd Army, located in Macedonia. The reason the 3rd Army was so susceptible to infiltration by the Young Turks was the unique situation that Macedonia was in. I'll go into more detail in a later episode, but the short version is that in 1903, a Macedonian group, sometimes referred to as terrorists or as guerrillas, incited an uprising that resulted in the intervention of Austria and Russia, who ended up partially occupying portions of Macedonia. This weakened Sultan Abdul Hamid II's control of the region, which allowed revolutionary organizations to flourish. Now, just because the Young Turks have more or less free reign in Macedonia doesn't mean that Abdul Hamid isn't aware of their presence or activities. As mentioned in previous episodes, the Sultan had a massive spy network across the empire, which resulted in a vast archive of information on individual members of the CPU and the OFS. He did everything within his power to get rid of or expunge the Young Turks from the Third Army, including but not limited to espionage, bribery, and outright repression, but none of it worked. The influence of the CPU wasn't limited to just the Third Army, though, but also the law school in Salonika, and it would be a student from this law school that would ignite the fuse of revolution. In February of 1908, a law student at the Salonika Law School wrote a letter to a relative about how he was asked to join a secret society connected to the Third Army. This relative he wrote a letter to was a minor bureaucrat and minister, who then passed it on to authorities who began an investigation into Salonika. This investigation was led by the chief of military police in Salonika, Nazim Bey, and resulted in the arrest and interrogation of 10 law students and about the same number of officers from the 3rd Army. After a few weeks, most of the students and officers were released. The investigation failed to uncover the CPU because not only did the CPU include high-ranking officers in the army, it also had members amongst the law enforcement and ministries of justice in the region, which managed to hobble the investigation. Though the investigation was prevented from fully uncovering them, the CPU was worried that the future investigations would get closer, and so Nazim Bey was targeted for assassination. On June 11th, Nazim Bey was shot. But he managed to survive, and he made his way back to Constantinople, where he delivered his report to the Sultan. In response to the report, Mahir Pasha was sent to Salonika on another inquiry mission in order to root out secret societies. After Mahir Pasha's arrival in Salonika, the commander-in-chief and the chief of staff for the 3rd Army were recalled to the capital, with the commander-in-chief being replaced by someone thought to be a loyalist to the Sultan, Ibrahim Pasha but ended up siding with the CPU Inspector General in Macedonia, Hilmi Pasha. Together they sought to have the officers who had been recalled to the capital return to Salonika. Mahir Pasha was recalled to Constantinople in early July, but he left members of his inquiry commission behind to continue the investigation, but to no avail. In another part of Macedonia, though, the Sultan's spy network was working. In Manister, an agent of Abdul Hamid managed to infiltrate the conspiratorial group led by the adjutant major Ahmed Niazi, who was already known to the secret police. Niazi discovered the Sultan's agent and decided that he needed to act before his group was exposed. He planned his rebellion for Friday, July 3rd. This day was chosen because most soldiers would be at Friday prayers, leaving the barracks and its arms unguarded. So Niazi and about 200 men armed themselves and headed for Rezni. In Rezni, the CPU controlled the offices of mayor, 
tax inspector, and police commissioner, which he hoped would form the central authority for an interim government to collect taxes and administer the empire while fighting against the sultan. He also issued a manifesto and had it sent to other revolutionary organizations across the region, as well as local officials, declaring his reasons for the insurrection. And his example would be followed by several other junior officers. Historians are uncertain how directly involved the CPU was with the start of the rebellion. The manifesto sent out by Niazi didn't reference the CPU or the Young Turks. Some have interpreted Niazi as acting on his own, with the CPU simply adopting his revolt as their own, publishing their own manifesto on July 6th, calling for the restoration of the Constitution of 1876. But by this point, the Third Army was fully involved in the rebellion. When news of the rebellion reached the Sultan's palace, General Sesmi Pasha was sent to crush the rebellion in Macedonia. On July 7th, Sesmi Pasha was assassinated outside a post office in Manister by one of his own officers, who walked away from the incident without reprisal. The troops he had with him were not regular soldiers, but rather locally recruited Albanians, so they didn't have the same loyalties to their commanding officer that other armies would. A new commander to replace Esmi Pasho arrived in Manister on July 12th, but the Albanians refused to follow orders, and sided with the CPU. Similar incidents occurred across the Ottoman-held Balkans, with officers loyal to the Sultan assassinated and their men subject to acts of terrorism. In response to this, the Sultan sent troops from western Anatolia to put down the revolt in Macedonia, but these were no more effective than those sent with Sesmi Pasha, with many of the soldiers having succumbed to the propaganda campaign the CPU had been waging in their ranks months earlier. The local Muslim populations of Manister would also rise up in support of the Young Turks and the Constitution on July 20th. Another uprising in support of the Constitution would also occur in Kosovo, who also promised to march on the palace and depose the Sultan if he didn't restore the Constitution himself. Similar events and threats were made throughout the region, Having control of most of the Ottoman Balkans, the CPU declares the constitution to be active under the territory they controlled on July 22nd. With all this, the Sultan was losing control of his empire in all directions. After weeks of failed attempts at destroying the CPU by means open and covert, he knew that there was only one option left. On July 22nd, the Grand Vizier and the Minister of War were dismissed and replaced by Said and Omir Rustu Pasha, who were known as reformers. This allowed the Sultan to make his next moves without appearing to have given in to the rebels. On July 24th, Abdul Hamid II officially proclaimed the restoration of the constitution. Following this proclamation came further decrees in early August, dismantling the secret police, ending censorship, and granting amnesty for all involved in the insurrection. The revolution was a confusing mess for most observers. The average person in the empire was unaware that anything was happening until it was all over. Before restoring the constitution, the Sultan's propaganda had been simultaneously portraying the Young Turks as anti-Islamic within the empire, while portraying them as anti-Christian to outside powers, warning them that they were going to commit massacres of Christian peoples in the empire. The CPU worked against this narrative by ensuring outside powers that they were secularizing the empire, which would benefit everyone living in it. There were also stories of CPU soldiers going out of their way to either protect Christians or to ensure them that they would be protected from the Sultan. This left outside powers confused, which is probably why they didn't militarily intervene, being unaware of what was actually going on on the ground. After the proclamation, however, Abdul Hamid worked to restore his image, claiming that he had initially suspended the constitution until he felt that the populace was educated enough to live under one. He also blamed the prolonged suspension of the constitution on bad advisors. Regardless of the true reasons for its suspension, most likely not what the Sultan said, he did everything he could to make it appear as though he was its most ardent supporter. As a side note, it is at this point I should inform you that the Young Turks went through one last name change. After the restoration of the constitution, they changed their name from the Committee of Progress and Union to the Committee of Union and Progress bringing the saga of continuously changing names full circle. The restoration of the constitution wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, though. The administration of the empire was thrown into chaos as no one knew what their powers or rights were anymore. Around the empire, mobs of people, upset from decades of abuses by the Hamidian regime, drove local officials out of office on threat of violence. 
Even in the capital, Constantinople, there were violent reprisals against members of the old regime, leaving only the CUP with enough prestige and organization to take control. But they didn't. At least not directly. In order to retain the semblance of moral authority they had, they couldn't take over the government without an election. There was also the issue of whether or not they were seen as legitimate authority. Most of the CPU were military officers or exiles who had no experience in governing. Many of them were also from the closest thing the Ottoman Empire had to a middle class. The old elite said that the young Turks were too young and lacked the religious authority of the Sultan and a caliphate. On top of that, it was a problem of sheer numbers. Even if the CUP wanted to directly take over the empire, there wasn't enough of them to fill all of the administrative roles. This is why much of the former imperial apparatus was left in place until the parliament could get up and running again, which left the Grand Vizier Sayyid Pasha in power. But his power wouldn't be uncontested. At the beginning, there was a three-way struggle for power between the CUP, the Office of Grand Vizier, and the Sultan. The initial struggle was over the appointment of ministers of the military, which the constitution of 1876 was unclear of whether it was the Grand Vizier or the Sultan who got to appoint them. Depending on who got this authority, they could control the military, and given how the revolution was started in the military, everyone could see that whoever controlled it could start a revolution of their own or undo someone else's revolution. The CUP wanted that power out of the hands of the Sultan, but the CUP didn't entirely trust Said Pasha either. When the Sultan granted amnesty to the insurrectionaries, he also gave amnesty to all the political prisoners within the empire. But along with the political prisoners, common criminals were also released. On top of that, Said Pasha and the Sultan had allowed corrupt officials of the old regime to flee the Ottoman Empire. Because of all these controversies, Said Pasha resigned from his position as Grand Vizier on August 5th, and was succeeded by another reformer, Kamil Pasha, on August 6th, who built a new cabinet and began making reforms. Kamil Pasha began his tenure by modifying old laws of the empire that were not in compliance with the constitution. He also began reorganizing the government, and created a new system of finance and taxation, which he would require to be published for the public to see on a regular basis. The ministries of government were reformed, and unnecessary parts were eliminated. He sought to revise commercial treaties with foreign powers, and he passed laws protecting the civil and property rights of all Ottoman citizens, including non-Muslims. This required the abolition of the old millet system, that allowed religious minorities to govern their own communities according to their own customs, along with the extraterritorial rights that foreign powers had been exercising in Ottoman territory. These reforms had created an atmosphere of optimism, but the hard part was yet to come. The new regime faced its first major crisis in October of 1908. From the Ottoman perspective, the Austrians and Russians had been conspiring against them since the Crimean War, and again in 1903 when they occupied Macedonia, and it looked like they were going to do it again. In 1878, one of these interventions created Bulgaria as an autonomous province with a Christian ruler, Prince Ferdinand I. Ferdinand fancied himself a full-fledged monarch, so when the Sultan's long-serving foreign minister, Ahmet Tevek Pasha, invited European diplomats to a dinner, he didn't invite Bulgaria's. Feeling slighted by this, on October 5th, 1908, Ferdinand decided to test the strength of a weakened sultan by declaring independence for Bulgaria and proclaiming himself as Tsar. Not to be upstaged, Austria announced its annexation of Bosnia-Herzegovina, which had been negotiated with the Russians earlier in the summer. Following both of these announcements, the autonomously governed island of Crete seceded from the empire and was subsequently annexed by Greece. The only thing that prevented this from being a complete humiliation was the quick action of Ottoman diplomats to negotiate financial compensation for the loss of territory. Despite payments received, this was a tough humiliation for the new regime, and it increased the distrust Muslims in the empire had for Christians both inside and outside their borders. On October 7th, a crowd led by Hoka al-Effendi marched to the Sultan's palace and demanded the constitution be abolished and that Sharia law be restored, including the banning of bars and the return of modesty laws for women. 
In other parts of the capital, speeches were made inside mosques, calling for the overthrow of parliament. And still in other parts, women were attacked in the streets for not being dressed in accordance with Islamic law. The final, and potentially most explosive reaction to the October crisis, was a mutiny of 86 soldiers at a barracks in Istanbul. They were going to be transferred to the Arabian city of Jeddah, but refused to comply. The soldiers from the 1st Army stationed in Macedonia were called in to put down the mutiny, which resulted in three deaths and three injuries. The CUP wanted to make an example of the mutineers, but the Grand Vizier Kamil Pasha intervened. After only three months, the new regime was facing challenges to its legitimacy. Not long after the territorial losses, elections were held, and despite being tied to the failures of the crisis, the CUP did pretty well. Within the parliament, there were no quotas for minimums or maximums on ethnic or religious representation. And despite that, the makeup of the parliament ended up more or less proportional to the ethno-religious makeup of the empire. Of the 274 members of the lower house, the CUP controlled 60 seats, giving it a plurality. The only other organized party to have any representation were the liberal unionists, who made up many of the young Turks who had sided with the majority at the first Congress of Ottoman Opposition Parties, who in the Chamber of Deputies were led by Prince Sabah Hadin. Ahmed Riza was elected as President of the Chamber of Deputies in recognition for his role in the revolution. However, Riza was hated by both liberals and conservatives. Prince Sabah Hadin's long-standing feud with Riza brought him into conflict with the liberals, and Riza had also been suspected of being a closet atheist which resulted in him being hated by conservative Muslims. And despite his fancy title, he didn't have much power. Most of the true power of the government lay in the hands of the Grand Vizier, who had thrown his hat in with the liberals. Despite heavily criticizing Kamil Pasha for his failures in the October crisis, the CUP wanted to retain him in power, so long as he pushed forward their goals. Despite this, however, there was an attempt to oust him in January of 1909 through a vote of no confidence in Parliament, which ended up failing. The attempt at ousting was most likely, at least on the CUP's part, not intended to actually oust him, but rather to weaken him politically so that he would be more compliant with the CUP's goals. However, Parliament was overwhelmingly in his favor, thereby giving him a greater sense of power, but it led him to underestimate the CUP. Kamil Pasha made changes to his cabinet, placing men loyal to him in the positions. Similar to how the Prime Minister of the UK needs permission from the Queen to form a government, the Grand Vizier needed the Sultan's approval to appoint new cabinet positions. And when Abdul Hamid saw the appointments he made, he remarked to his secretary, I know Kamil Pasha. This man wants to become a dictator. In response to these appointments, a string of ministers resigned in protest, claiming that the Grand Vizier should have consulted the rest of the cabinet before replacing members. On February 13th, the Chamber of Deputies demanded that Kamil Pasha explain his actions, but he refused, citing concerns involving foreign policy. The Chamber rejected his claim, which led the Grand Vizier to threaten his resignation if he wasn't given more time to wait. The Chamber, fearful that Kamil Pasha was consolidating more and more power behind the scenes, held a vote of no confidence that overwhelmingly pushed him out of office. But before this news could reach the Sultan, Kamil Pasha and another minister resigned their offices. On February 14th, on the advice from Ahmed Riza, the Sultan appointed Hilmi Pasha as Grand Vizier. Despite this, however, things were not going to get better. Having lost their man on the inside, the Liberal Unionists began a press campaign against the CUP, and the CUP responded in kind. Foreign-run newspapers in Turkey also took part in this media war, most taking the side of the liberals. On March 3rd, the CUP passed a law that required all public meetings to be announced at least 24 hours in advance, which would delay reaction times for protests. On March 6th, a liberal newspaper published a document that implicated the CUP in a blackmailing scandal against members of the old regime. On April 7th, the editor of that liberal newspaper, Hassan Femi was murdered, and the liberal unionists blamed the CUP, and his funeral was used as a public demonstration against them. But the liberals weren't the only opponent the CUP had to face. On April 5th, the Society of Muhammad was established. It was a conservative Islamic group headed by clerics who opposed the liberal social policies of the CUP, 
especially those eliminating Islamic codes of dress and behavior. It believed that the empire must be unified through Islam rather than ethnic or national identity. It was also very outspoken against the policies of the liberal unionists, but because they both opposed the CUP, they became unlikely bedfellows, siding with the liberals in the society of Muhammad were members of the old regime whose livelihoods had been destroyed by the reforms. It was this atmosphere that created the conditions for counter-revolution. On the night of April 12th, the troops of the 1st Army Corps displaced their officers and marched on Parliament, being led by students training for Islamic law. Hilmi Pasha called a meeting of his ministers while sending out his chief of police to try and talk to the marchers. The leaders of the march demanded the resignation of several ministers and the president of the Chamber of Deputies, Ahmed Riza, as well as the restoration of Sharia law. The soldiers stormed the parliament building and ended up killing two people. Ahmed Riza, concerned for his life, went into hiding, seeking protection inside the building of the Baghdad Railway Company. Hilmi Pasha and several other ministers went to the Sultan's palace and resigned their positions. The Sultan also accepted the demands of the soldiers, and on the morning of April 14th, he appointed his former foreign minister, the one whose dinner party with European diplomats triggered the October crisis, Tevik Pasha, as his new Grand Vizier. The rebels hunted for members of the CUP, raiding and destroying its offices around the capital. And like that, the power structure of the CUP collapsed overnight. How involved the Sultan was in the attack on Parliament is unclear. Many suspect that he was involved in the planning of the uprising because he was the immediate beneficiary. He also accepted everyone's resignations very quickly with little fuss. On April 15th, he proclaimed the restoration of Sharia law, which just so happened to have restored his own powers as Sultan and Caliph. But the CUP wasn't completely gone. In several cities throughout the empires, the local branch of the CUP called for restoration of constitutional authority. In the city of Adana in southern Turkey, these calls led to clashes between pro-revolutionary Armenians and supporters of Abdul Hamid II, resulting in some of the worst massacres of the Armenians since the crisis of 1896, with around 20,000 deaths. The liberal unionists filled the gaps of government left behind by the CUP, with the understanding that this was a temporary measure until they could get Kamil Pasha reinstated as Grand Vizier and restore the previous order. The only place where the committee still held sway was within the Third Army in Macedonia, and refused to recognize the new government under Tevik Pasha. On April 17th, portions of the Third Army, combined with other units loyal to the Constitution, formed the Action Army, which marched on the capital. By April 23rd, the Action Army surrounded Constantinople, and the next day it stormed the city. The palace guards made their last stand at the Yildiz Palace, but it did not last long. The Action Army cut off electricity to the palace. Servants were seen escaping with whatever they could carry, and the Sultan was eventually captured. On April 25th, the general commanding the army, Mahmud Sevket Pasha, along with his chief of staff, Mustafa Kemal, the future Ataturk, imposed martial law on Constantinople, while supporters of the counter-revolution were publicly executed in the streets. On April 27th, Parliament proclaimed the deposition of Abdul Hamid II and elevated his brother to the throne, crowning him as Sultan Mehmed V. And to add insult to injury, the former Sultan was exiled to Salonika, the headquarters of the Third Army. Although the CUP had been restored, the events of April 13th showed that they did not have the power to control the empire and maintain order. The real holders of power were the army, who made sure everyone knew that they were not acting on behalf of the CUP, but on behalf of the Constitution, but in reality were acting on behalf of themselves. The series of events that led to the counter-revolution were taken to heart by the CUP, and it was the conservative reaction to the CUP's policies that pushed the CUP in a more conservative direction, in order to prevent such an uprising from pushing them out of power again. And this is where I want to stop the narrative for now. This episode is a bit shorter than the last couple, but I think the counter-revolution is the best place to pause before next time, when we'll look more into the domestic aftermath of the counter-revolution and the foreign reactions to the growing instability of the Ottoman Empire. 
If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you can email them to historyofthemodernmiddleeast at gmail.com. If you want to keep up with what I'm doing, then you can follow me on Twitter, at Grant G. Hurst, where you can get quick responses from me about whatever you're wondering about. If you enjoyed this podcast, I would appreciate it if you gave it a rating and a review on iTunes or whatever podcasting service you use. It's the best way to help this podcast get more attention other than telling friends or family you think might enjoy it about us, which I would also encourage you to do. So thanks for listening, everybody. I should be back in about three weeks. So till then, hear you later.